took me many years to even go by Bundy and San Vicente. Every time I would go by there, I would become like nauseous or something. It would just really affect me. I'm Jill Shively and I'm the witness that almost collided with O.J. Simpson on June 12th at the intersection of Bundy and San Vicente. I moved to Santa Monica about 1980. I've been living there ever since, up until that time. In 94, I was in the same place I'd been since 1985. Uh, <clears throat> I knew the area really well. My store to go to all the time was Westward Ho, which was in Brentwood, about three miles from me. And um, so that night on June 12th, I got in my car around 10.40, 10.45 at the latest. And I, um, I was heading east on San Vicente, trying to make it to Westward Ho by 11 p.m. And as I'm approaching Bundy, is when I almost run into O.J. Simpson's Bronco. Uh, I would have probably seen the Bronco sooner, but there were no headlights on his car. I um, swerved to the right of me to miss him. He went up onto the median. There's a middle median right there to avoid hitting me. And I realized <clears throat> to avoid hitting a gray Nissan, also on San Vicente, heading west. So he had kind of both of us cornering him in. I'm staring at, oh, this person at the time, I didn't know who it was, and they're looking at me, glaring at me as if I had done something to them. They were looking at me like, why did I almost hit them? They were glaring, giving me this angry look. And I was angry because I had a small little VW bug. I thought it was gonna get hit and possibly killed being a single parent. I was really angry about that. So as I'm looking at him, he sticks his hand out of his car and yells at the Nissan to move, move. So they, they moved three times, going the same direction. OJ would back up, the Nissan would back up. Instead of going forward the opposite direction, Finally, the Nissan backed up and OJ's Bronco took off north on Bundy and his lights were still off. I remember seeing his brakes, tail lights, but his lights were still off. He didn't even turn them on. Um, when he yelled, move, move, I realized who it was, it was OJ, because I had just seen the Naked Gun recent movie of him and I recognized his voice. I thought he was a drunk driver because why would you drive like that? He takes off, the Nissan backs up. He's still sitting there, we're watching OJ leave. And we kind of looked at each other. And then he took off west on San Vicente. And I just went ahead and went to Westward Ho, thinking I've got to get there by 11. And when I got there, it, they, the salad bar was down. I didn't get what I wanted. And then I just turned around and went back home. I made the phone call to report him as a drunk driver before midnight. I remember it was before midnight when I called in. I looked up the number, it was like a three, was, I didn't call the 911, but I looked up West LA's LAPD phone number, and I think it was on Butler, Butler Avenue. And I called that number, and I called and reported him as a drunk driver. I wanted to let them know that this self-entitled jerk was running around drinking and driving and uh, they needed to do something about him. So the next morning I, I was waking up early around six. I remember calling my mom because I would take my daughter over to her place because she would take her to preschool. So I said, hey, you know, I want you to I want to tell you what happened to me last night. All Jay almost hit me. She goes, oh my gosh, it's all over the news. Um, OJ's ex-wife and a friend were brutally murdered. The bodies of Simpson's ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and Ronald Goldman were discovered early Monday morning. Later, a police forensics team began a search of the crime scene and OJ Simpson's And I'm like, oh my God. So I was really, I felt scared at that time. She felt scared for me. And she was saying, um, but you better call them and let them know that 
and we kind of argue we're not argue we talked about stuff no, but I called him last night and I let them know what he was doing and what, that I reported him and I had his license plate number she goes oh, no 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 you you should call again because I because I told her the whole conversation about me calling it in and the lady who took the phone call was kind of dismissive of me well no one was injured or hurt you didn't crash so what report am I supposed to basically take so I said okay so, okay, I'll call before I go to work. So I call it again between six and seven, I think that before seven that morning, and I called West LA again, said, hey, I want you to know what happened last night in case you didn't get that report or something didn't, didn't you know, you didn't get all the information. So this time when I called in, they were very attentive, they listened, um, the license plate number, I told him I had it, and then they said, okay, we took everything down, and then they had, they said, we're gonna, um, we're gonna have some police come out to your home. And uh, I think the next day is when the police officers came out. Two police officers came to my home, uh, I think on the th 13th or 14th, I um, can't remember the exact date. They came to my home, they uh, asked me, what I what happened, exactly what I saw, who did I think it was, and uh, did I have? Any, could I describe the uh, the Bronco, and did I have the license plate number? And I I told them, well, I know the last three numbers were seven eight eight. I can't remember if it was three C W Z or three C Z W, but I said. Um, I, I have, I have those numbers down. It was a white Bronco with shiny rims and the plate was a white plate. And then he wrote down the number on his card and then he wrote down number down on a report. And, um, they said, okay, um, no one will know you're a witness. Um, so you just, you know, we, we will protect you. No one will know that you're involved. And then the next day, I'm getting bombarded by the media. They're coming to my door. So um, somehow people knew who I, I, that I was a witness and what was happening. So David Kahn um, was the original prosecutor on the case. He had just won the Menendez trial. So they wanted him to try the case. So he was the, my contact person with F Phil Van Adder and uh, Phil Van Adder and David Kahn were my uh, people that would, I would talk to about the case. They're the ones that interviewed me, did my background check, um, checked all my story out, checked the license plate out, and um, they confirmed that I uh, you know, the timeline was what was the right timeline for me to, when OJ left the place, when they th thought the murders had occurred. And he basically, David Kahn was saying to me, hey, you know, um, I'm sorry about somehow the your name got leaked. All the witnesses' names got leaked. They're getting them bombarded with, with uh, media. Um, and, there, you know, it's not much we can do. But just you know, try to try to stay away from the media. Try to stay hidden. And uh, so then um, I had all these people come to my door. Hard copy came to my door. They were saying, "Hey, you know, Jose Camacho has been talking. Other witnesses are talking. I think it was, I don't know if he did or not, but Dale St. John was talking. Other witnesses. So we need you to tell your story because, and we want to get it out now. So like they rushed me. I think I did the interview almost the same day on hard copy. And I, I remember trying to call Patty Jo Fairbanks. She was the witness coordinator. I had a number on a card. I couldn't reach her, but then it became evening. I did the interview with hard copy the next day or two. I called fat. I think it was Patty Jo Fairbanks. Finally got a hold of her. Um, let him know, hey, I did this interview, and then that's when all hell broke loose. Marsha Clark called me into her office a couple times um, to get on me for 
doing this interview and, and blowing, she said, I blew her case. She got in my face and said I had blown her case. And then she didn't need me anymore because she had enough circumstantial evidence. I went to the grand jury, they picked me up. Uh, Marcia was there asking the questions to, to me. And then you're sitting in this large room full of the grand jury. And, but I just focused on Marcia and I, I think she drew a diagram of my car, OJ's car, and, and the other guy's car. And we just, uh, I just tried to stay focused on that. I could see, I thought they were taking notes and things. It was very nerve wracking. And uh, she was asking me basically what happened that night. And everything seemed fine. And then uh, we, were, we were done with that grand jury. I don't think I was there for very long, maybe a couple hours. Let's talk about the relationships um, now uh, that, that you have. Well, um, Tanya Brown is probably my uh, favorite person. I met her through a mutual friend, I don't know, I don't know, 10 years ago maybe, something like that. And <clears throat> we got to meet and we got to talk and she was just such a sweetheart, so kind. Um, so she was just like the starting point of where I was able to start healing my own self. Um, I never got to meet any of the other key players until recently I met Cato uh, through his podcast with Tom Zenner. And Cato is such a sweet, sweetheart too. He's uh, very kind. Um, and it's kind of nice to be able to talk to him. And then I met Alan Park via the phone. Uh, we've talked a couple times. And it's kind of nice to be able to talk to someone like them because they understand where we all were at that time and how hounded we were and, and the emotions we went through and how the fear we went through. Like if the trial, it was if OJ was convicted, was there going to be another riot? Were, it was kind of feeling in fear for our lives sometimes. Um, that was, and, and they, it's a shame that we all didn't get to talk and meet then because we kind of could have helped each other out because I felt like I was going through it alone. And uh, I even had people come to my door um, and just uh, be, become threatening to me that, you know, hey, if I testify, I'm part of the, uh, the conspiracy to convict OJ. I'm, I'm, I'm prejudiced and all these things. So um, it was, I had this guys were sent by Skip, somebody named Skip, and they offered me 40 grand to, to go on vacation. This is way before the even trial started. This is like preliminary stuff. And I said, no. And I, I remember I had to hire an attorney to protect my, I felt like I was, I felt unsafe. So I had to hire an attorney to, to get people to like, back off, leave me alone. Um, it, you just felt so unsafe and no one understood where, where you were coming from. Even my family, we had to move from where we were. We stayed at a French beach house for like two years almost. So, and my daughter, people following us around and um, she didn't understand why people were peeping in her window at night, looking as I'm putting her to bed. And it was just, there was, it was it's so so invasive <clears throat> and people were divided so so strongly and um, they were just wanting to to make something out of of anything I ever said or did so it, it was if I had the meeting like Tom Lang who Tom Lang was always good to me from the very start him and Phil Van Adder I loved them both they were always my advocate they stood up for me um, you know, they, they were always very good people. They even, they stood up, they stood up for me against Marsha a lot and they couldn't understand why, you know, she wasn't using me. They had run every background check they could ever run on someone. So, um, but again, you just felt so alone <clears throat> because you go back to your family and there I had some family members that I'm, they were just not happy with the situation. And uh, they didn't like it that um, this was happening. It was, you know, they were getting harassed by media. 
I think one of my older brothers, the National Enquirer, he wanted him to sell a story on me. And uh, so it, it was just all around. And this, this case um, touched home for you, right? Oh, yeah. Um, well, my, I, we, have a, we have an older sister in, um, in August of 94. She was uh, beaten up and left for dead in a canyon by a, a boyfriend. So she, there was domestic violence case there, too. At the time we got there, they had airlifted her to Henry Mayo up in Valencia. But by the time we got there, she had passed away. So, yeah, I, after that even, I felt like this was blood money. I, I had definitely not supported domestic violence or that issue. I have such a <clears throat> compassion and respect for them and love for them because I, I always make sure when we bring up one of their names, I bring up the other. If it's Nicole Brown, um, I want to make sure Ron's not excluded and vice versa because a lot of times people say one or the other and uh, they were both there that night. And I don't want to make, I want to make sure that none of them ever become forgotten. Ron was there, I think, trying to protect Nicole. And uh, he died because he was trying to help Nicole. Did you ever go by the crime scene? Not after, not after, the murders happened in 94. Um, it took me many years to even go by Bundy and San Vicente. Every time I would go by there, I would become like nauseous or something. It would just really affect me. So I would go, I would never go in those areas. Um, we, I, and then in 2000, I don't know, three or four, we moved to Salt Air, which was near uh, Bundy and, and San Vicente. <clears throat> and so then at that point I was I was I had driven by Nicole's place which had been at that time the front had been re re redesigned so it wasn't any longer 875 I think it was changed to 879 the front had been reconfigured um but whenever I do go by there it's it just it's creepy to me and I feel like ghosts are haunting me it's it's horrible uh, with Marsha um, I just wish that she would have uh, not listened to other people saying that um, I was a, a bad person or a felon. And after everybody had done all their checks on me, um, the, it, it, there was no, there was nothing in my character, nothing in my background that would have been derogatory. And even I remember the Vanatter and Lang and saying, "Hey, just put her on the stand." Let, let them, let them, let's, let's let them, let's deal with it. Deal with it head on. And uh, I remember her saying to me, I'm gonna make an example out of you. And, uh, and then she wanted to like, I don't need you. I have enough circumstantial evidence. Um, you, p p witnesses who sell their story, it, it, it ruins their credibility. That's what, that's what she told me. And that's why she said I blew her case. And, uh, but then again, she said, yeah, I have enough circumstantial evidence. I don't, I don't need you. Uh, there's just such conflicting things. She had already dismissed me and I, I, I hated that feeling. I wish that she had given me another chance. Um, I think I would have been a good witness on, the, I, at that point I was like, okay, whatever it takes, I'm, I'm gonna make sure I'm redeem my, myself somehow. And that's when I started turning down all kinds of money and, um, I think, I think I would have been a good witness. I, I don't think I would have, I don't know how anybody would prepare for that, but I think I would have like, after having to deal with her, I think I could have dealt with the, the defense team. Well, I only watched a little bit of that, but I saw one thing that really bothered me. So they had this lady named Romy Rosemont portray me in the, in the film, on the show. And she's very dramatic and she comes there talking to Marsha. I don't remember that part because I was pretty scared of her. So I, and I was pretty feeling, I was feeling like I was, I had done, I thought I had done something wrong and she, I was gonna be arrested. So I was never that animated. And then the other thing that bothered me was, um, and I talked to the producer, Scott, I can't remember his name, but they went, oh, they show OJ's Bronco running through the intersection, his lights are on. And I said, why did you have the lights on? 
because for for dramatics effect, it, it, we wouldn't have been able to have seen him. I said exactly. That's why I didn't see him. And uh, you know, and so, but that bothered me because it's like that. That's not what happened. And it even says in the book that Jeff Tubin wrote, based on this uh, TV show, the lights were off. And um, so, I didn't like that they changed that because that was an important reason why that I didn't see him. And that was why I thought he was drunk. If he has lights on he, and he almost hit me, then I would just think he's just speeding too fast. But I had heard a cop friend say, usually when people are driving drunk at night, they forget to turn their lights on. So then that's how they end up hitting people. And that's exactly what I was thinking and why I thought he was drunk that night. So I didn't like that part. Um, that, that was the whole reason why I didn't see him. Because I didn't see him until I was right on him. And I almost slammed right into him. It was very overwhelming. I felt very irresponsible. Um, I just felt like I had contributed to uh, OJ getting off. I, at that time, I didn't know what was gonna happen, but I felt like I didn't contribute to, but whatever reason I was there, I didn't do my job. And I didn't, I didn't know I, in hindsight like that it would be a bad thing. And I turned down over a hundred, over a hundred thousand dollars from that point, trying to make myself credible in her eyes again. I turned down all kinds of energy, all kinds of money, even though I'd lost my job because of this case. I had lost my job. I didn't have any money coming out of unemployment. It was, it was, it was just <clears throat> changed our, everyone's life, everyone in my family. It affected everyone. Um, so if I could go back and reverse that, I would never have spoken to hard copy, but it is what it is and it doesn't change my story. I, I, thought in, I thought at that time, like, oh my God, I'm a horrible person. I've done blood, I felt like I accepted blood many. I felt like this is the worst thing they ever could ever do. And I thought, oh my God, the families are gonna hate me. And so I just felt horrible about my actions. And it took me a long time to make peace with it. And I actually got to talk to the Browns and the Goldman, Kim Goldman. And so they helped me with that. I apologized to them. It, it, it was just, I felt like it was not the right thing to do. So now in my life, I've learned to let go of that guilt and that feeling. I've learned to let, I've learned to heal it. I will always, I feel like I'll always be tainted by that night, but it's not, it's not all of me and it's not as a big of a sore spot in my life. Um, I realized that I did what I did, but I did not blow the case. There was, was too many other things that ha happened during the case and the trial. And I, I, don't, I don't think I was the sole reason that, that OJ was not convicted. I, um, my daughter's older, um, life is good. Um, and I'm able to like talk about this now without feeling like I was part of the, the bad part of the case. I can talk about it now in a way where I don't feel so horrible about that night. It a, was a horrible night as it was, but I realized I, I, I could not have changed the outcome. I don't, I don't believe that I could have changed the outcome. I think that um, I've learned to make peace with it. And by talking to other people that were involved in the case, it's made it a lot easier for me. Like, okay, here's what happened and uh, how can I move forward from this moment on?